operating in the Middle East, the 9th United States Air Force, commanded by Major General Lewis Brereton, prepares for one of the most daring raids of the war, a daylight bombing of the Ployest oil fields in Nazi-controlled Romania, fields that supply the Nazi war machine with nearly a third of its vital petroleum. Now, from bases in North Africa, 1,200 miles away, American bombers are ready to strike. Months of planning are behind the attack. For weeks, crews have studied their target, made practice runs perfecting the precision of the bombardiers. Now the great fleet is skyborne. More than 175 giant liberators streaking across the Mediterranean and not an enemy plane in sight. Over the coast of Greece, across the rugged Balkan mountains, past the Danube, the bombers roar upon their mission. The first wave swoops low as the target is sighted. Ploiest's 19 square miles of oil derricks, refineries, storage tanks and cracking plants. From 500 feet, they pour incendiaries, then bombs. 300 tons of high explosives right on the mark. most heavily fortified areas in all Europe, the bombers fight their way home, knocking out 51 enemy planes. Although 21 bombers failed to return, the raiders struck the Nazi war machine a crippling blow. Home with battle scars, mission accomplished. the historic citadel of Quebec comes Britain's fighting leader, Prime Minister Churchill, for important military conferences with United Nations leaders. Welcomed by Mackenzie King, Dominion Prime Minister, Mr. Churchill brings his wife and daughter Mary, a subaltern in Britain's Auxiliary Territorial Service. Quebec's picturesque Chateau Frontenac, scene of the first conferences, Canadians of French descent give Mr. Churchill a rousing welcome. Today, his V for victory is more than a gesture of defiance. It is a symbol of achievement. Mrs. Churchill is popular here, too. Her untiring efforts in behalf of Britain's war-torn families have endeared her to the people. This is the first time she has given up her war work long enough to accompany her famous husband on one of his many journeys. While Mrs. Churchill rested in Quebec, the Prime Minister visited President Roosevelt in the United States. Now Mr. Churchill and his official party await the arrival of Mr. Roosevelt in Canada. Here, with other United Nations leaders, new drives are being mapped to bring the Axis to the terms of Casablanca, unconditional surrender. In Chongqing, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek and Madame Chung observe the beginning of China's seventh year of war against Japanese aggression. On behalf of President Roosevelt, General Stilwell presents the Generalissimo with the Legion of Merit, America's highest decoration to a foreign military leader. For Madame Chang, it's her first meeting with news correspondents since her recent return from the United States. Although still showing the strain of her long journey, she plunges anew into the fight to free China. At one of the famous Henry Kaiser shipyards, the Brock Miller family have established an amazing record in the annals of shipbuilding. Headed by the father, every one of the family's 15 adults, including the girls, is helping build America's liberty ships. On payday, each member of the family invests part of his wages in government war bonds. 
Father Brockmiller brought his big family of children and grandchildren here to work nearly a year ago. And they've certainly made good on the job. Mother's role is in the kitchen. Cooking and serving food for 29 hungry Brockmillers is a job in itself. The Brockmillers, a family of patriots. Workers on the home front, all helping to win the war. In California's beautiful Yosemite Valley, sailors on leave from battle zones enjoy a well-earned rest amid the peace and quiet of scenic national parks. In surroundings like this famous resort, men respond more quickly to treatment, recuperate more rapidly from the shock and wounds of war. California's giant redwood trees provide a picturesque setting for Uncle Sam's convalescent sea veterans. Although they're enjoying the vacation, they're all eager to get back in the fight. At Palermo, General Patton is welcomed to Sicily by Cardinal Lavatrano, the island's highest ranking prelate. The church greeting the American army. The cardinal says his people will cooperate fully. For the Americans, in the name of the United Nations, at last bring peace to Sicily. Meanwhile, United States engineers push ahead, spanning mountains with brand new roads to speed the Allied advance upon Messina. Building machinery landed with the invading troops clears the way. In a matter of hours, supplies are moving up. Bridges blasted by retreating Axis forces are quickly repaired. The road back. Hordes of prisoners, nearly 200,000 captured by the combined Allied forces. High-ranking officers, half a dozen generals join in the surrender. Eloquent evidence of the collapse of the Axis war machine in Sicily. 